when you get ready to start thinking about buying a house, there should be lots of questions that you may um, have. Um, like, is it time for me to buy a house? Is that a smart move for me? Uh, should I talk to a lender? When should I talk to a lender? Um, should I use a realtor? How much money am I going to need? What can I afford? What are the closing costs? Um, and then also, what's the difference when you get into it? What's the difference between an appraisal and inspection? What happens when I find the home that I want? What's the next step? Are there other costs that I ought to know about? What are my options? Tons of questions, obviously. What happens at closing? Um, you would wonder about a lot of those different items. But the next few slides, what we have is we want to break that down into just a eight simple step process. There's lots that goes into each of the steps, but if we can just break it down and just make it a little simpler for you, that's what we're looking to do. Don't want you to be um, afraid of all of the negative negativity that you've heard um, recently in the mortgage news world because home buying, it is a great time to buy a home. Um, yes, property values have decreased some, but we all have faith that things are on the way back up. So it's a great time to take advantage of our market, and but more importantly, it's a good time for you to go, okay, let's evaluate where we're at. Am I ready? Do I have a place to move on to that next step? So um, that's what we're going to do. The uh, first thing we need to do is to become pre-qualified. Um, and, and with that, um, you'll, you'll find out what you can afford. Then you're going to begin your home search. Once you've found that home and you've got a contract signed, um, then you'll need to be able to get the necessary financing that's involved with that. After that, um, when you've submitted that loan application, that's when the processing of the application begins where the lender is going to verify your credit, your income, your assets. They're going to order the appraisal on the home that you've selected. And then once the processor begins, um, finishes gathering all that good information, they're going to actually submit it for approval. Um, that's going to be with an underwriter either at that lender's institution or it may be even at some other investor, um, some other type of lender institution. Then once it's approved, the underwriter will give you the go ahead to schedule the closing, give you that approval, and you'll, uh, go to loan closing. That takes place in an attorney's office. You sign all those documents, you get those keys to that house, and then um, you get to move in. And then of course the following step after that, which is what you thought about ever since the beginning, making those payments on time. You cannot afford it. And then you'll be able to make those payments. So, it seems a little simple when we break it down this way, um, and it really is a simple process, but each step along the way has details and processes within the steps that I want you to be aware of tonight. And that's what we're going to take a little bit of time and just kind of examine each step. Um, so let's kind of go back to the beginning. Pre-qualification. As I said earlier, buying a home is still a good investment, and if you buy and borrow smart, then that puts you a step ahead of everybody else. That means that we don't want you to get in over your head. Um, too often, first time buyers and even return buyers um, start the home buying process by shopping for that house. It's like going out to look for, when you start to look at 2003, 2013 uh, new Cadillacs, when you really should be looking at a 2009 Chevy or something like that, okay? It's very, very important to make sure that you don't overextend yourself and overbuy. You need to get pre-qualified to find out what you can afford. Your credit union mortgage originator will usually help you with that. Um, your lender should, first of all, review your credit score. Does, does my credit score need improvement? Where am I at in the uh, range of things? They're going to examine your affordability. Do I need to pay off some debt first, you know, to be able to get to where I can qualify? Um, planning for savings and reserves is important, too. There may be things in your budget that need to be adjusted um, in order to bring you into a range where you can afford it and you feel comfortable making that timely payment on time. And then that lender should also 
uh, be able to help you explain, you know, explain all the processes, to be able to take you step by step and, um, you know, kind of handhold and walk you through that process. You need to have that kind of trust with your lender. Basically, there are three C's involved with getting pre-qualified for a loan. We're going to be looking at your credit, which is kind of boils down to what your credit score is. We're going to be looking at your capacity, and the capacity has to do with what is your income, what are your debts, how do they look together, is your income high enough to take care of all your debts, plus a home, you know, that's very, very important. Also with capacity is uh, assets, you know, do I have money for a down payment, do I need to look elsewhere for a down payment, do I have somebody that can give a gift to me for the down payment. Um, that kind of thing goes into the capacity. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then the collateral. The collateral is the property, the house that you're going to get. Those are the three basic items that go into getting pre-qualified and then later on um, will go into actually getting you able to be approved for that one. Just simple. So, the first thing <laughs> credit. Everybody's talking about your credit score. Your credit score is that first item that's going to allow you to buy or to keep you from buying. Okay. Um, different loan products have different credit score requirements, but in general, and again this is in general, you will need to have a minimum score in this range in 620 to 640 in order to qualify for most normal mortgage loan products. Now, this can vary from lender to lender, and um, some lenders may have, you know, products that they offer in-house that um, may be a little different, but in general, if you're out there, um, you know, looking at mortgage institutions or other financial institutions, that's the range you need to be looking at. <clears throat> Most people have three different scores. And what I mean by that is there's one score from each major credit bureau, and I'll talk about them in just a minute. Uh, the middle score is used. So you, you have one probably that's high, one that's low, and then one that's kind of in between. That's that key one that they're going to look for, is the middle one. Um, you know, some people might have a, I have seen, you'll have a, a 702, a 660, and maybe a 653. So we're going to be looking at the 660 because it's the middle one. You know, kind of take out the high and the low. And then also another good rule of thumb is that there are normally required three to four active trade lines. Um, what, what that means is your trade line is simply your credit cards, your auto loan, um, a personal loan maybe that you have that you took out to maybe pay off some debt or something. Um, those are the loans that institutions report on a monthly basis to the different credit bureaus. And they call that traditional credit. Okay. Sometimes we can use things that are called that are they refer to as non-traditional credit. Um, non-traditional credit are items like your uh, rent payment. You know, maybe your landlord doesn't report to the credit bureaus, but um, you know, you've made your payments on time and we can verify that through uh, canceled checks that you've written to them or um, something like that. Your utility payments, um, if you, you know, pay for your water and electricity, um, those are non-traditional types of credit items. Your cell phones, just about all of us have cell phones now. And so those payments also um, can be verified for, um, you know, in order to get a non-traditional credit history. Thing, things of that nature. Um, more and more, however, lenders are going to uh, credit that has to be verified. Um, but they want to see that on those three credit bureaus' um, documents in order to actually make it um, truly identifiable credit information. So be aware of that because it's very important to establish that um, credit history. Um, as you can see, it's, it's very, that's one of the main three things. So, um, I know that um, Family Trust has done a cup, uh, already uh, a Know Your Dough um, presentation about you know, how to develop your credit history and how to you know, maintain that. So 
um, reach out and um, ask your lender for help if you, you know, need some additional help with that. It, regardless, in order to keep that good credit, um, kind of some just things um, that may seem simple, but paying your bills on time, obviously, is a big deal. Um, avoid finance companies, and I'll kind of explain that in a little bit. Um, avoid maxing out your credit limits. Um, judgments and collections that show up on your uh, credit bureaus, um, histories, those need to be pay off, paid off and they need to be taken care of um, in most instances before you can um, look at a, at a home. This next slide um, kind of gives you an idea of where some of these items, um, how they relate to what your credit score is. Uh, a lot of people ask what goes into creating your credit score. That's a pretty good question and if anybody has that secret answer, um, you could probably make a lot of money off of it <laughs> if you have the calculation that they use. Um, it can vary between the different credit, euro, uh, credit bureaus and their formulas. Like I said, kind of they keep it secret, like it's in a vault or something. But um, in general, the most weight is placed on your timely payments. That's the dark blue there that you see. Um, that means, you know, you're making your payments when it's due, not, not 15 days or 30 days after that. When the payment's due, you're making those payments and they're reporting that. Then how much credit you've used, that's your capacity um, in this particular slide. And that's the um, on a little good portion there. This means that if your credit card limit is $1,000, okay, that's your limit on there, and your balance is $900, your capacity is pretty much used up, okay? So um, that will cause your score to be lower, okay? Think about that, because it's really easy to max out those credit cards, but it has a direct effect on your scores, okay? So if you have more than one credit card, and they're all pretty close to that max, then your score will most likely be affected negatively. So it'd be a good idea to start thinking about how to get those credit cards paid down. Okay, because you can see how what big what a big portion this is of your whole credit score. Lisa, if I could, that, sure. that's a, that's a key point there, and I don't want people to miss that. We talked about it last uh, month with our improved credit score. The balance has to be no more than you really should not be carrying a balance of more than thirty percent of your total allowable credit that's been extended to you. And they look at each card. So if you've got two or three cards that are offering a thousand dollars each as a max, you should not be over three hundred on any one card. And then they combine all three of them together. You shouldn't be over a thousand. So they look at it both ways. That's that's a balance that when you exceed that thirty percent mark, your credit score is impacted negatively, and you begin to see your credit score get ticked down. So that's a real key point there. And like, I, like, like we said, it, it's one of the major factors. And we look at credit reports all the time, and that's one of the first things that we look at. Yes, ma'am? I have a question. If you go over that 30% and then you pay it down, does it automatically, does your credit score automatically jump back up, or does it take time to build that back up? Okay, that's a good question. She's asking, um, for those that may not have heard, if you go over that 30% threshold and you pay it down, does it automatically take effect? Well, here's kind of a, I guess the key to that. Um, normally, like financial institutions report on a monthly basis, okay? And sometimes they're gonna be a month behind reporting to the credit bureaus. So there's kind of a time lag in there. You pay it off today, well today's November 13th. Most likely that, that institution's not going to report to their bureau until the end of the month or the first of the very next month. And then if, if your score's not pulled right at the right time, really, it might not really show up until the next month. Okay. So there could be a, a big time lag between when you have affected that credit and but it, it actually like, reports. But it does but like vary. It does vary, yeah, it really, it really will. And um, timing has a lot to do with it. Um, it depends on when the institution actually reports to which credit bureau to, because remember I said there's three scores. And so you're looking at um, the middle score, well, you know, it, the, the institution may have reported to one bureau one month and it didn't get reported to the other for another month. So, you know, unfortunately, there is some time in there that 
really you can't, <laughs> you don't have any control of, and, and you know, we, we really don't either. So. It, it takes it time, time to time. Bounce, to bounce back up. Because keep in mind what we're looking at here with the credit score is a snapshot of your financial integrity. We all talk about integrity and all your ability to manage whatever. This is this is a reflection on your ability to manage the credit that's been extended to you. So when you do have a bump in the road, it's not it's not the end of the world. It does take time for it to bounce back though. It doesn't happen overnight. But with that said, it can happen fairly quickly if you're steadfast with it. You stay with it. And um, a good um, mortgage lender originator will take time to go through your credit report and say, yeah, this is this is what you need to work on. This is where we need to work. And if you do this, you know, wait three months, or depending on what it is, you might want to wait six months and come back and let's look at it again and see where you're at. Um, and, it, and it is just because of that, because it takes time. Yes, ma'am. Well, what about credit cards that you have paid off? How does that impact your credit score? Because I've heard that it Good. impact your score negatively if you're no longer using it. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about that just a little bit. Um, if you pay it off and keep it open, then you should be okay because what you're looking at is I have this limit of $1,000. I have a zero balance, so that could, I've got a lot of capacity there. Okay, um, But if you close it out, there's no capacity. Okay, So there you see that's going to affect that quite a bit right there. Does that make sense? Yeah, don't close out credit card no. accounts. Let them just kind of fade off. You know what? But the key is to cut that thing up. <laughs> so you're not using it. Yeah, the only time okay. we probably recommend closing an account is if they're charging you an annual fee. And sometimes yeah, that's, that's something you need to look at. If they, if they charge an annual fee and it's on the listing, then it's a different story. But for the most part, let them just ride off and don't, don't use them anymore. And that, that uh, protects your integrity again. Um, we're also going to need to pay attention to your length of credit history too. Um, they want to, you know, the, the credit score wants, to, the credit bureaus want to include how long have you had credit, you know. Um, and the longer that you've had credit, good credit that is, um, the better. Um, let's see. Um, so it's better, like I was just saying, to keep that card open. You know, it might have been a card you got, you know, when you, you know, were just old enough to get a card um, and it's you know zero balance but keep it open just keep it in mind with the um, actual annual amount possibly the types of credit utilized is also a weighing factor you see this is in the lighter blue part here um, timely payments on secured loans are going to weigh heavier than they are on revolving debts um, and then also as I mentioned loans from finance companies tend to pull your credit, your, your credit score down a little bit. Um, they're just looked at differently with higher rates and they're looked at very differently by the credit bureaus. Older credit will begin to have less and less of an impact as time goes by too, so your past credit applications, you know, do have a small bit of that, but, um, the, you know, that's why we say the older bad credit will begin to be less and less of a factor in your credit score, but you do have to take care of certain things. Collections and judgments need to be taken care of, even if they're medicals. Um, we can sometimes, and with some loans that we keep in house, um, look past a little bit, if you will, the medical situation. Just depends on how big we're talking about. But in general, you really need to talk to take care of those things. And the best place to go is um, www.annualcreditreport.com. Um, this is the best way to find out about what your credit looks like, you know, on your own. Um, you can go to this website, it's free. Um, you can request your credit score, but you're going to have to pay for that. Um, many of you, if you've already been to some of our presentations, probably already know about that. But at this site, you can review everything, um, all the accounts for all three bureaus. And here's where we're going to talk about these. Um, the three major bureaus, and there's Four, and there may be others, but these are the ones that are looked at most, most um, in mortgage lending. The Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. And it's important to make sure you know what's reporting to all three of those zeros, not just one. Because many, many times, um, normally if we're just looking at somebody's credit really quick, we're only going to look at one. We, we typically at Family Trust look at the Equifax score. Um, but 
what happens is sometimes things are reported to the other bureaus and we don't see it on the Equifax. So it's really important for you to take charge of that and know what's going on with my credit. Um, you can go once a year and get this um, and take a look at that. It's important for your identity theft also, um, which obviously being in South Carolina now, we're all a little more in tune to what that could possibly mean. So um, it's really important to take advantage of this and to go and educate yourself about it. Don't be dependent upon you know, me or um, the credit union or, or somebody else because um, you need to be aware of what your credit score's um, looking like. Okay. Capacity. We talked about that a little bit. Um, can you pay and can you repay? Um, they're going to, you know, we're going to be looking at um, income, um, how much money you bring in, how much you pay out each month to determine if you can afford a, another monthly payment in your budget. Um, a rule of thumb, most conventional loans, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a little bit, um, most conventional loans require that your debt to income stay 40 to 41 percent. Okay, that's for conventional loans. And that debt to income is based on your gross income, and we're talking about debts that show up on the credit reports. We're not talking about debts like um, your utility bills and your gas bill and your cell phone bill, things like that. It's the ones that show up on the credit report that we're going to be looking looking at. Um, it's easy that um, it, it's easy for us to calculate a percentage that we say, okay, you're great, you can afford this. But keep in mind, we're not looking at you know how much you have to pay every month in gas, how much your groceries are how much your electric bill is. Those are all on top of what we look at when we qualify you, okay? And we're also not looking at your net income. We're not looking at what you bring home. We're looking at that gross number. So it's kind of inflated. Be very, very careful about overextending yourself and falling into the trap. Oh yeah, you can afford that house. Well, on paper you might can, but can you really afford that house? Are you going to still be able to go to the grocery store? Are you still going to be able to put gas in your car? Um, do you have children that drain you and drain you money? I mean, that happens. Um, I have two, one just out of college and one in college. It drains you, I know. Yes? Is that potential housing payment, is that just a payment? Or is that insurance? Is that upkeep? Is mm -hmm. that everything? It's a very good, that's a very good question. Um, the potential housing payment for, for what we look at is the principal and interest, your taxes and insurance only. So we're not talking about, you know, any other upkeep that you have to have, you know, if, if your water heater breaks or, um, you know, if a tree falls, falls in your yard, you've got to have it removed. I mean, any upkeep like that, that doesn't go into that. So. The affordability for us is kind of a black and white thing on paper, but the affordability to you and what you feel comfortable with paying is a, could be an entirely different situation. Did that answer the question? Taxes and insurance. Taxes and insurance are included in what we look at to qualify. And it's homeowner's insurance and your property taxes. Um, sometimes there's homeowner's association fees depending on what type of home it is, and that's also included in that ratio. Typically, in order to kind of come up with this, we'd like to see um, your most current full months pay stubs, 30, 30 days of income. Um, a lot of times we'll also look at maybe just your W-2 um, to verify. Now, there's a different borrower that's a self-employed borrower, okay? And a self-employed borrower this is just a quick note to let you know, if, you're, if you happen to be self-employed or one of the borrowers is self-employed, you, you know, you may have a, a normal, you know, paycheck and a W-2 and, and that, and if somebody is um, self-employed or even has commission income as part of their, as the main part of their income, this is what we're going to need. We're going to need a two-year history of that and two years tax returns to document it. <coughs> If you happen to own your own business, 
with that as well, as far as like a partnership or if your business is a, um, an S corp, and this kind of gets a little bit more detailed. But um, we'll also need those business returns for these two years as well. Too. Okay, keeping on with capacity. Remember we talked about um, capacity also involves how much you can um, you're going to need for your assets for the down payment for reserves possibly we're going to be looking at checking savings checking savings accounts possibly um, 401k um, the gift funds if if you're lucky enough to have a family member that can gift you some money um, there is specific documentation that we're going to you know you know be looking out for that and there's some products that allow that some loan um, products do not it just really depends on what um, product you're, you know, happen to uh, qualify for. And then some other retirement plans too. Um, typically with these, we're going to need to see um, two months complete statements. You know how you get the statements if in, the, in the mail, if you, if you do get them in the mail, or you go online and you can print out your statements, um, and there's, you know, one of six pages, that six pages blank. Now, I have yet to figure this out, um, but you need to have that six page too. It might be blank, but if you don't have that six page, our underwriters are gonna, they, they're gonna hold that file in their drawer until we get that six blank page. So anyway, keep that in mind. If you're kind of gathering documents and, and all, just make sure you have everything complete. Um, it's kind of crazy. But. It looks like it's different discrepancy. That's true. That's right. You've got six pages, but I've only got five. What's on that six page? Did you take out all your money on that six page? That's what they're looking for. It sounds crazy to us because we're like, it's blank. It's blank. You're right. Good point. You could come teach this. <laughs> okay. Assets are important because they are. They do show your source of down payment. They show your ability to repay the loan in case you had a hardship. Um, you know, if, you know, you always hear the um, rule of thumb that you need to have a little bit um, stored away for a rainy day. Well, um, it's becoming more and more um, required for certain loan products that you have a certain number of months reserves. Um, it can vary depending on what kind of loan you have. It, it can also vary um, your approval if you have a lower credit score but you have a lot more assets that can kind of help to offset and um, cause an underwriter to want to more, you know, be, it'll be easier to approve your loan because you've got that nest egg to back, back you up. Uh, it can make them feel a little bit better about that lower credit score. So the more the better when we um, ask to document your assets. Okay. that um, it seems like there's a lot for just one little step in the process um, but the things that we've covered so far are very important throughout the entire process um, initially we really just need to kind of pre-qualify you see where you're at um, and it's really based on our conversation with you um, there really aren't any confirmed verifications of assets or anything like that when we're just looking to pre-qualify. We're just sitting down, we're talking, here's where you are, here's where you need to be. Um, it's an honest sharing of your financial information with the mortgage lender and we depend on that. Um, it helps us gauge what kind of price range you can begin to look at. Um, many times the seller is going to look at an offer that you give um, when you've gone through the pre-qualification process um, a lot higher and give it a lot more thought than they would somebody that's just, hey, yeah, I want to buy your house, you know. So um, I've kind of listed this slide here because there's a big difference between being pre-qualified and being pre-approved. The basic difference is if you're pre-qualified, it's based on just estimates and rough calculations of what you've talked about with your lender. A pre-approval involves a lot more. A true pre-approval will involve verifying your income, verifying your credit. Um, it, it's going to look at everything, basically everything except the appraisal on that house. Very few lenders are going to be willing to do that because it's costly to them. Um, a lot of times um, we have to pay to 
verify your income through big corporations. Um, it costs a lot of money for us to give the manpower for uh, that, that type of processing. So anyway, um, it can be done, uh, but just keep in mind that this, on this side, when we're just kind of talking about uh, rough, rough numbers, it's going to be free and usually a lot quicker to get than a pre-approval. Pre-approval is going to be more time consuming because you're basically processing that loan. Okay. Get on to the home search. After you have been qualified, then you guys um, know, you uh, have narrowed it down, you know what you can afford, what you can qualify for, and then you can begin your search for that home. Internet's a great source, and I know um, most of us are very um, used to looking on the internet. You can, it's a, it's a great source to find homes and be able to look inside because they've got great pictures on a lot of the realtors' uh, websites out there. Uh, most of their websites have information about all their listings as well as, as other companies' listings in the area. And they also have information about their agents. And um, you can you know, basically select the agent that you'd like to work with too because um, they'll list that, that information out there for you too. Um, they'll help you find the home. They all, their realtors are buyer's agents, but they're also seller's agents too. So bear that in mind. Um, they have a strict code of conduct so that if they're the listing agent, um, you know, and they happen, you happen to come say, hey, I really like this house, you know, they're going to you know, let you know that. They're going to say, well, I'm the listing agent. And they, they have things that they'll talk with you about. So um, you need to make sure that you find one that you have um, confidence in and you can put your trust in. And um, they'll, they'll handle most of the process for you and kind of help you. Um, go over the, the different um, obstacles that can be in the way sometimes. Um, the most important part that they're going to work out for you is negotiating that contract. Um, that can be a daunting task because when you look at a six to eight page contract and it's got all these addendums and things like that, you're going to have lots of questions. And so they're, they're going to be your best friend in looking, looking through that contract and trying to explain things um, to you. And then once you get that contract um, settled, um, you're going to need to get that to your lender as quickly as possible so they can start to process that loan. There's several ways you can actually submit an application. If you've already been talking with a, a lender, then they're probably going to have already have a lot of information about you um, that they can just go ahead and put into whatever their software system is and get that application started for you. For family trust, uh, we do have an online application. We have ways, and most lenders do. You can schedule an appointment, you can call them, you can email them. Um, there's various different ways to get that application actually started um, to get everything going. Here's just an example of some things that we're going to need from you. Of course, we're going to need the purchase contract. Uh, we're going we're to need copies of your driver's license, and sometimes we're going to need copies of your Social Security card. So if you don't know where those are, or if you're like me, it's kind of crumpled up in the, in your, in, you know, somewhere in a, a safe deposit box or something like that, um, that's something you need to uh, look at trying to dig out or even go into Social Security to get, to get one. Um, we talked about some tax returns, your W-2s, paychecks, um, bank statements. One of the things um, we need to think about if you are divorced or if you are required to pay um, child support or anything like that, we're going to need to take a look at that. It's not because we need to know everything that's going on, but what we're looking for is additional debt. Okay? If you have to pay child support or alimony, we count that in your debt to income. Okay? It is. Um, reported and um, doesn't show up necessarily in credit report, but that, that's an additional thing that we're, we will have to look at. And then sometimes um, uh, you may have to pay application fees, and usually those involve um, paying for a credit report that reports all three bureaus, possibly you have to pay for an appraisal. Just depends on the lender, um, and it sometimes will depend on the loan product that you're looking for as well. What you're going to get after you make application is typically um, you're going to get either in the mail or maybe right there while you're talking with your lender, you're going to get a typed application form. You're going to get a bunch of disclosures that go over the loan product. Um, now keep in mind, during this application part, this is when we're going to be talking about the different loan products. 
um, you know, what, what kind of loan product is going to suit your needs the best. And if you've worked and pre-qualified with a lender, then there, you, you're going to already kind of have a, a notion as to what product you're going to best fit for your need. So um, you're going to get kind of a big old packet of, this, of disclosures, and um, you're going to need to go through those to make sure you understand them. You're going to need to sign them. They're going to include an estimate of all the closing costs. Um, there's also going to be what may be some additional forms that are investor-required forms. Um, sometimes institutions will keep your loan in-house um, at their institution, and you'll make your payments to that institution. Sometimes, depending on the loan product, they're going to sell it, and they're going to sell it to an investor. If they sell it to that investor, then that means that we have to comply with that investor's requirements. There may be specific documents that they ask for that um, you know you wouldn't normally think that they're going to require, but um, they they are going to be the ones that are kind of in charge of approving that loan. So um, there may be some additional forms there from that particular investor that you uh, may have to sign and and be aware of as well. Um, we also make sure that we let you know, hey, we didn't get that divorce decree, so we're going to need that divorce decree. Uh, we need an additional pay stub. Um, need that 2010 tax return. Uh, we're going to let you know what all we need, and then we'll give you copies of everything that you signed. It's very important once you submit an application and you get those documents back not to delay. You are kind of in control at this point. Because if you don't sign your documents and get them back and get that loan moving, then you're, you're going to be in jeopardy of possibly delaying your loan approval. Well, if you don't get your loan approved, you're not going to close. So you're going to delay closing. Um, lots of different things can kind of happen there. So you need to make sure that you return them in a timely manner. Usually the mortgage um, originator is going to say, hey, can you please have these back to me by such and such a date? And it's important that you try to... Um, make sure that you meet that day. Um, also, during this time, you're going to be looking at uh, selecting the attorney for the closing. In South Carolina, it is your right to select the attorney that you would like to use to close that loan. Okay? So, um, you know, you need to begin to familiarize yourself with the local attorneys or um, depending on where you're buying, you, you know, may have to go, go out, of, out of state. Um, but you know, you'll need to be begin to think, be thinking about that. You also need to be thinking about at this point your homeowner's insurance company. Every lender is going to require that your home is properly insured. So um, go ahead and start, you know, looking at that and, and taking a taking a look at those different insurance companies. You have lots of options out there. The loan processing is going to begin at this point, and that's when, like we said. Um, we're, we're going to verify your income. We will contact your employer. Um, usually that's within it in written form. It can also be verbally. Um, so we'll, we'll be, you know, calling personnel, um, to, excuse me, to verify your income and, and your employment, how long you've been there. You said you were there for two years. Have you been there for two years? If you haven't, we're going to be looking at your previous employment. Um, usually we need to have a two-year history of employment. So um, if you've only been somewhere for a year, that's okay. We just need to know who you were previously with so we can verify and make sure there weren't any major gaps in employment. Um, we're going to be verifying that you do have those funds. And that's when we're looking at those bank statements. Six pages of six. Um, do I have the most current bank statement? Um, you're going to be looking for large deposits on there. Um, we'll talk about that here in just a minute, too. Um, at this point in the process, the appraisal is going to be ordered. Uh, once you select the attorney, we'll request a title search on the property. And then there's other property inspections that may be completed. Um, I'll, I would encourage you, and I know a realtor will encourage you too, to get an inspection, home inspection on, your, um, on the home you're looking at. Well, normally, um, we, are, we as a lender are not going to require a home inspection, so to speak, unless the appraisal comes back and the appraiser goes, wait a minute. I walked in and I fell through the floor. You know, I mean, that's going to be a problem. So there may be additional inspections that have to be um, ordered at that time. And um, again, the realtors are very, very helpful with this because they will help um, schedule those inspections. And they know a lot of people um, that will help 
help with that, and if repairs have to be made, they'll help you negotiate through that as well. All right, look. This is what I was talking about. If at any point during this time we have a low moment, this is usually what happens. Um, where do they come from, that is. If there's undisclosed debts. Um, for instance, if we didn't know ahead of time that you do pay child support, and you know, uh, and we find out, okay, we've got to go back, we've got to look, okay, do they really qualify again? That could be something that completely, you know, takes away that qualification. Um, any new debts, if you're going to go look for a house and you submit an application, please don't go buy a new car. <laughs> I mean, that just, puts, that just puts the whole thing to a halt many, many times. Unless you're, have, unless you're replacing a debt with another one at the same amount or lower, it could possibly be very detrimental to whether or not you get approved. So, um, new debts are a big thing. Um, undisclosed real estate owned. Um, when a, a lender looks at your capacity in your um, debt to income, remember I talked to you about that 41%. Um, they also look at any other real estate that you might own. Um, you, you may have um, listed on the credit report the payment, but they're going to want to know, well, how much are your taxes, how much are your insurance? What's the extra part of that payment? Is it included? So they're going to be looking at that. Um, sometimes collections and judgments will show up on another credit bureau again, and maybe that could happen. All right, large cash deposits and what I call mattress money. If you've got money stashed away underneath your mattress or buried out in the jar in the backyard, that we can't document that money. And the lender doesn't want, we like that money because we'd like for that to come into our institution, but on the mortgage side of it, we don't like that kind of money because we can't trace it. And so it's important that if you have that money set aside, which is good that you've been able to you know, establish that savings, we need for that money to be seasoned. And what we mean by that is it needs to be in that account. You need to go ahead and put that money in that account, and it needs to sit there for a couple of months. So when we look at that bank statement and we see the 60-day balance, it's in there. And it's not popping its head up going, whoa, I got a $10,000 deposit. Where did that come from? Oh, it came from here and here and here and here. And boy, is that a big old fit file when we've tried to trace all of that money and find out where it came from. So if you're getting used to money, you recommend that you go ahead and put that. Well, let me tell you a little bit about gift money. Gift money has to be documented too. So if, if your parent is giving you a gift, then what we normally require is First of all, they're going to sign a letter that says, hey, I'm giving this to my daughter, and um, it is entirely a gift. I have the funds to give. You know, I'm giving it. Um, then we're going to need to see their ability to give you that money. I don't, you know, whatever their bank statement is, we don't really care about it, but we need to know that they have that money. So, and that can be a tricky situation. So we do need to see, here's where the money's coming from. It's in your parent's name. They have it to give, and then they're going to ask to see the transaction. So they're going to see it coming from their account to your account. So all of that has to be traced. Um, it, it's simple if it, if it all happens like that, um, but um, that's how that would be documented. Um, it's okay to do it ahead of time, but we still need to be able to go back and trace it. Yes, the, the gift letter itself has wording in there that says this is a bona fide gift that is not required to be repaid. Yeah, if it's, it can't be anything but that. Now, that's on that piece of paper. Okay? <laughs> um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> if you quit or change your job, that could also be an issue. Um, obviously, because that affects your income. Um, so it, it's not sometimes, it's not the end of the world because usually we can work through that. It just, again, it might delay things a little bit because we, if, if you're in the same line of work, we can tend to work through that a little easier. But if you've completely changed jobs, um, it could cause some delays. 
We're normally going to need to see that you've been on that job and have a 30-day pay stub showing that you've been there at least 30 days. Okay. So those are just some things to keep in mind that will completely stop and halt the process. Okay, I promise I'm not going to keep you much longer. Um, the loan underwriting, after the loan's been processed, it does go to a loan underwriter. There again, remember those three C's I talked about? Credit, capacity, collateral, that's what they're looking at. And it's not only the um, family trust underwriter that looks at that, it could be an investor's <coughs> underwriter. And if you have something that's <coughs> called PMI, and that is private mortgage insurance, anytime you put less than 20% down on the property, you're going to have to have additional insurance that basically protects the lender. It is in addition to your mortgage uh, payment. Um, it's included in it, but it will cause your payment to go up. Um, they may have to look at it too, so always remember that additional documentation still might be required. They may still ask some questions and ask for additional documentation from you. Um, once that happens and you get the executive approval, uh, sometimes it feels like we have to go this far to get it, but um, that um, you'll, you'll get your clear to close, you're good to go, we can schedule that closing date and um, then you'll be able to get to the closing. Just wanted to put a few things here in front of you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That PMI, what did you say that? Okay, sorry. Typically, and I'm talking right now about an, about a, a conventional loan, okay? Um, if you have less than a 20% down payment, most loan products for a conventional loan are gonna require that you have private mortgage insurance. And it can range, it depends on the loan amount and your credit score. Um, it can um, range anywhere from an additional 10, 15, upwards to 100 or more. It just depends on the loan amount. And that's really not insurance that protects you. It protects the lender because you don't have what we call skin in the game. We're not putting any money into it. You know, the less money that you put down, the riskier that loan is. Okay, and so we take out our own kind of insurance, but we make you pay for it. Doesn't really sound right, but it does. <laughs> That's kind of the way it works. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's a good question. Okay, at closing, this just gives you it's a real small snapshot. A lot of things happen, but it kind of tells you a little bit about what you should expect and what the other. Um, people that will be getting you to closing or at the closing, what they're going to be doing. Um, the attorney's the one that, that right now, unless, unless um, things change, uh, will actually be preparing that settlement statement. Um, and what that is, is that lists out all of the costs that have happened during the loan, every, all the inspections that had to be made and were paid for. Um, it's going to list out your loan amount. It's going to list all the fees that the lender may have charged on the loan. Um, they're going to have that statement prepared, and basically that's going to let you know, bottom line, here's what you need to bring. Um, they're the ones that actually do that. They oversee the closing and see everybody sign everything. They record the new deed. Um, the seller will sign over the deed, and he, they are responsible for getting those keys to you. You're going to be signing mortgage documents, and you are responsible for making sure you have a cashier's check for the down payment and closing costs. If you have a loan product that's going to require those. And then um, the lender normally prepares those documents and um, sends the amount to cover the actual loan amount. It's important, I want to make sure that everybody knows, you've heard about the robo um, signing on the foreclosures. Well, a lot of that happened because people didn't know what they were signing at closing. Okay? It's really important that you trust that lender, that you trust that realtor, because you need to make sure that you understand the loan product that you're getting. Those papers that you're signing have a lot of things on them. So if you get to this point and you don't understand something, somebody didn't do their job, because we need to have educated you about this time where you're comfortable with what you're, you're signing. But it's important for you to understand it, to read it. If you don't understand it, you need to be asking those questions. And don't feel bad for stopping at this point and saying, you know, I, I don't understand that. That's not what I signed up for. Because the attorney and the lender will work with you to make sure that we get that taken care of for you. All right. Then you get to move in. I'm sure that's the easiest step of all um, to get all that stuff um, moved in. And then as we said earlier, making those timely payments is very, very important. Um, 
your mortgage loan payment is due on the first of the month in most cases. Okay? Due on the first, not the 15th. On the first. A lot of people will wait till the 14th or 15th to make that payment. And that's okay sometimes, depending on your loan documents. But look, that's a bad habit to get into. Start making that payment. Make sure you make it by the first of the month. Because if you get into the habit of doing that, it's easier. And you know, and I realize there are times that we, we're all put in bonds and we have to stretch that out a little bit. And that's what your grace period is for. But it's very important to get it to make good habits for good timely payments. All right, here's just a few additional considerations that will come up, and we'll talk about some of these. You've heard me talk about conventional types of loans. These are ones that are typically um, done with a lender, and you're going to make a down payment, and we're going to finance. You're going to make a, payment, a down payment of like 3% to 5%, and we're going to be financing most of that loan, typically in a conventional loan. 680 is the credit score, okay? Remember I said earlier you need to target 620 to 640? Well, that's because there are loan products that will allow you to do uh, a lower loan amount, and we'll, uh, uh, excuse me, a lower um, credit score, and we'll, I'll show you those in just a second. Um, but a 680 and up is for conventional financing. This is going to get the normal fixed rates that are out there, fixed and or arm rates. You may be required to have PMI. If you have to have PMI, you're going to have to have a, a basically a 680. Um, we, we do have an outlet where we can get a lower credit score with PMI, but boy, you have to have some assets or you got to have something else that's going to offset that lower credit score. And generally, a conventional loan will go up to $417,000. Um, other loan types are FHA. This is, this uh, FHA is the Federal Housing Administration. These are government-backed loans. FHA loan requires 3.5% financing. Um, they will allow down payment assistance. Um, there is a flyer for the uh, City of Rock Hills program that will help you with the down payment assistance in that. Um, our investor um, that, that Family Trust works with, um, we have an investor that will allow that down payment assistance program along with the FHA program. Um, so it's a less, little less of a down payment required here. Um, 640 and up, again, the stronger you can make your application look, the better. So um, keep that in mind when you're looking at the FHA product. The VA product is only if you or um, your co-borrower are veterans. Okay, 100% financing, typically 640 and up, but again, it's for veterans only. And then USDA, this is the uh, United States Department of Agriculture. They, it's you know, you, uh, these type of loans are a little bit more difficult to to do. Um, it's 100% financing. You do have some credit score limitations with that. We can actually look at a 620, but there's kind of some ifs and buts with that. Okay, so that's going to vary depending on the investor that you're going through to get this type of loan financing. So I just kind of, I went ahead and put 640 as a general. But keep in mind on this, there are income and property limitations. You cannot make over a certain amount depending upon uh, the median income of the area. And also on this USDA loan, the property has to be located in a USDA eligible um, uh, area. Okay. Um, and you can actually look up on USDA's website, um, you know, if, whether or not a property address is. I will say that the majority of Rock Hill is not USDA eligible. You're going to be looking at the western part of York County, um, York, Clover area, possibly some areas in Fort Mill too. Um, to be, if you're going to be looking at a loan like this. Um, that's what you need to, to, that's where you need to look, okay? And again, your lender can kind of talk to you about those various different ones and decide if your situation fits with that loan product. That's where it's very important that you talk with them. Yes, ma'am. Um, with the USDA, say you get the loan um, working a certain job, and then two years down the road, you get another job. 
rates were going crazy. Okay. Just a few things to remember, kind of in closing here, so you guys can um, get home. But um, review your budget and think about what you feel comfortable with, not necessarily what we can qualify you for. Okay. Go ahead and get that pre-qualification, not after you found that dream home, but before you start to look. Because you need to know what you're looking for. What kind of price range you're looking for. Um, if you're a qualified borrower, you're going to have more purchasing power than somebody that's just, you know, willy-nilly, hey, I'm looking at a house and I want to buy it. <laughs> and remember, the three C's that we talked about, your credit, your capacity, your collateral, those are going to be looked at before you can get that one of the information that you'll have there. Um, feel free to go to our website. There is a place out there on the mortgage part tab that um, talks about different um, things when you're looking at the home buying process. So please familiarize yourself with that. You can email me or any of those ladies there. We all get this email. So if you have questions, please feel free to do that. You can email us directly to, um, again, our cards are there, and I have some cards over there as well. Um, so I uh, just want to thank you guys for coming.